Good morning. So it's really nice to see a full room like this. Hopefully there's some seats in, in the front. If you want to move to the front, please. There's a few seats left. So uh, I'm Bashir Tawli. I work uh, at Timi here in radiology. So it's my great honor to introduce the uh, Timi Symposium uh, keynote speaker for this year, Jan Lucan. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have him here. So Jan Lucan is the current chief AI science scientist for uh, Facebook. Um, he is also the founding director uh, of the NYU Center for Data Science. Uh, he's also associated with NYU. Um, he's a silver professor of computer science there. And he's also a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, just a, a, a brief uh, biography about Jan Lucan. He's been, uh, he actually trained as electrical engineer in, back, back in France and then received a PhD uh, in the uh, Université Pierre Marie Curie in Paris, in France, and then moved to uh, North America to briefly to University of Toronto, who was a postdoc for a couple of years, and then took on the job of uh, uh, in charge of the head of image processing research at AT&T Lab uh, in New Jersey, and then moved again to uh, NYU in 2003, where he was uh, founding the NYU Data Center, uh, and has been associated with Facebook since uh, 2013, where he has been leading uh, uh, the, the research on you know, machine learning, deep learning, algorithms, and, uh, um, and also robotics and computational neuroscience. So it is really highly relevant uh, for us as radiologists and uh, imaging scientists to uh, um, you know, get speakers and talk about AI. Uh, this is really uh, coming to us, and there's a lot of misconceptions uh, among radiologists, a lot of fears, and I think uh, hopefully he will explain to us uh, what we need to do, how can we embrace it. Uh, and so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Jan Lucan for his lecture titled Power and Limits of Deep Learning for Image Understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Okay. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not go going to give a talk on medical imaging. Um, I don't directly work on medical imaging. There are, surprisingly, perhaps for some of you, there are people at Facebook who work on medical imaging. Uh, Facebook is trying to leverage all the technologies developed uh, in computer vision and other areas for applications that are not directly related to any business that Facebook is interested in, and medical imaging is one of them. Um, and we're actually looking for partners, so if you're interested. Um, uh, but I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit of the history, the state of the art in deep learning and what the next challenges are and perhaps where the uh, technology is going. And then towards the end, a little bit about the kind of uh, consequences to society, to uh, certain professions and, um, uh, and, and how it might change the way, the way we think about, uh, about things. Uh, but let's start, with, um, let's start with deep learning. Um, so all of the applications of uh, what we now call AI, or the new AI, if you want, uh, are based on something called supervised running. Right? So supervised running is uh, the process by which you train a parameterized program, essentially. Um, so think of it conceptually as uh, a box with knobs on it, and you're going to adjust the knobs, and those knobs determine the input-output function of the, of the system. And supervised learning consists in uh, showing the machine lots of examples. Uh, for example, if you want to uh, uh, train a machine to distinguish images of cars from images of airplanes, you show the image of a car. If it turns the red light, you don't do anything. If it doesn't turn the red light, you adjust the knob so that the red light increases in brightness. And then you show the image of an airplane, and same thing. If the green light doesn't turn on, you uh, adjust the knob so the uh, green light brightness increases. Um, and this is surprisingly effective if you have enough data. Um, so in the, in the context of medical imaging, of course, that means you have to have lots of data of a very uh, diverse population of uh, patients and uh, lots of positive cases as well as negative cases, and you have to label the images uh, to be able to um, identify things uh, on them before you can train the machine. But that's been surprisingly effective for all kinds of applications, for speech recognition, translating speech into text, um, uh, categorizing images or detecting objects in images, recognizing faces, producing captions for images, uh, very useful for the visually impaired, um, classifying uh, topics of a text, uh, translating languages, um, things of that type. Uh, the reason why deep learning is called deep learning is very, a very simple reason. It's because those systems are built as 
kind of a cascade of modules. Uh, and because they have multiple layers, we call them deep. Um, so the traditional, and this is by uh, contrast with the traditional approach to pattern recognition that was really dominant until very recently, where you take a, a signal, an image, whatever it is, and you engineer a way of pre-processing this image in such a way that uh, the essential characteristics that you are interested in in this image are, are uh, 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 expressed. And then you plug a simple classifier that can be trainable with a few samples. But most of the work goes into designing this feature extractor. So deep learning basically has replaced this uh, by uh, uh, what we sometimes call end-to-end -end training, but really that's what deep learning is about. So you, you feed the machine with essentially what, what is raw, it, raw signal, a raw input, and you tell it what the ultimate answer is, and it kind of organizes the function of each of the modules inside the system so that it arrives at the, at the right answer at the end. Uh, more modern deep learning systems are not built simply as a cascade of modules, but you can think of it as a graph of, of modules uh, that, that kind of does this, this computation. And so the next question you might ask is, what do you put in those boxes? And that's also surprisingly simple. Um, and that goes back to ideas that uh, started popping up in the 50s, uh, something called neural networks. Uh, there was a wave of interest in neural networks in the late 80s, early 90s, in which uh, I was already working on this. And the idea of a neural network is you alternate linear operators. Essentially, think of an image as a list of numbers. It's an array of numbers, but you know, think of it as a vector. Um, any signal, really, even text. And then you're going to multiply this by a matrix. So basically, compute weighted sums of the input variables. And then you're going to take each of the components of, this, of the resulting vector uh, and transform them to a nonlinear function. And the nonlinear function, in this case, is uh, something uh, generally very simple, like a half-wave rectifier. So something that just takes the positive part here. It has one kink in it, a nonlinearity. You have to have nonlinear operations in there. Otherwise, there is no point uh, stacking layers. Um, and then you repeat the process, multiply the result by uh, a matrix, uh, or compute weighted sums of uh, variables, which is the same thing, and then nonlinearity, linearity, linear operation, nonlinear operation, etc. You alternate the two uh, multiple times. So the adjustable parameters, the knobs that I was talk talking about earlier, are the coefficients in those matrices, and that's what we're going to adjust uh, for training. And the way you do this is, uh, in supervised training, you you tell the machine, here is the a picture that you're supposed to recognize. Uh, produce an output. If the output is incorrect, measure the discrepancy between the output you get and the output you want, and then uh, figure out in which direction and by how much to change all the knobs so that the output you, you get gets closer to the output you want. And you can measure this through an objective function, basically measuring the distance between the two outputs, very simply. You average this over thousands of training samples, and now machine learning becomes an optimization problem, finding the minimum of a function with respect to the parameters, all the knobs uh, of the machine. Um, and that's done using something called stochastic gradient descent. So now the next question is how do you figure out in which direction to tweak all the knobs so that the, uh, the cost uh, function, the objective function, goes down? And that's done through an algorithm called backpropagation, which I'm not going to go into. These are the only equations in my talks. In my talk, to be don't, uh, and I'm not going to explain them, but it's basically a practical uh, application of chain rule. It's not a particularly sophisticated concept in uh, mathematics. You learn this in depending on which country you are in, in uh, first year of college or in uh, high school. Um, but it, it's very simple. It consists in basically propagating signals backwards in the graph of operators that, co that constitute your, your neural net, so as to compute basically sensitivity factors that, that tell you in which direction each knob should be changed, each coefficient in those matrices should be changed so, the, so that the output goes in the right direction. Now, back in the late, late 80s, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm known for is something called convolutional networks. Uh, so it's a particular way of connecting those uh, things with each other or specializing the type of linear operators that are used uh, in, those, in those architectures. And the architecture of the convolutional net actually takes its, its roots in classic work in neuroscience. So there's uh, uh, Nobel Prize winning work in neuroscience by Hubel and Wiesel in the late 50s, early 60s that um, uh, showed how the uh, primary visual cortex area, uh, neurons are connected with each other, they look at a small receptive field in the visual field, and then there are complex cells that sort of integrate the activities of those things. And it turns out you can turn this into an architecture of a neural net. And that's what a convolutional net is. And there were ideas along those lines uh, by a gentleman called Kunui Fukushima in the 80s. 
in the early 80s. But I, I sort of worked on this when I was at Bell Labs in the, the late 80s, um, um, about an hour south of, of New York City here in, in Homedale, New Jersey. Uh, we came up with this architecture, which initially we applied to handwriting recognition because that was the only task for which we could get data. Uh, and also it was simple enough that the networks we, uh, that had to be built to solve that problem were small enough that we could run, uh, we could run them on the computers at the time. So basically a, a convolutional net is a particular type of neural network where the, the units are connected to uh, a small number of units in the previous layer. And there's two types of units really, the ones that have weighted coefficients, that computer weighted some of their inputs, pass them through a nonlinearity. And there's another type called pooling, which sort of integrate the activations of those units over, over an area. And the purpose of this is to build a little bit of distortion and shift invariance. And so this is an example of a convolutional net, um, kind of vintage 1990s or so, uh, that is trained to recognize handwritten uh, digits in this case. Uh, each column is a different layer, so the signal goes from left to right. Uh, and uh, each pixel represents the activity of uh, one of those units. Uh, sometimes people call, people, people call them neurons. I don't like to call them neurons because really they're so much simpler than actual neurons. Um, but this is sort of uh, the, the, the dream of a neuroscientist of being able to actually exa examine the exact state of every neuron in a, uh, in, a, in a nervous system. So here we can do this because it's software. Um, so uh, what happens is that the system by itself decides how to represent the images so that uh, as the signal goes from layer to layer, you get more abstract representation that kind of capture the nature of the input and sort of eliminates all the irrelevant information. In this case, the position of the three or its uh, special uh, shape doesn't really matter. Very quickly, we realized that we could use those systems not just to recognize objects, but also to detect them and localize them and, and also uh, recognize multiple objects simultaneously. And that turned out to be really important for practical applications like, say, reading checks. So by the uh, end of the 1990s, we could build systems based on those convolutional nets that could read uh, checks, and by the end of the 1990s, there were uh, the s a system that we built was reading somewhere between 10 and 20% of all the checks in the US. So it was very successful. This was just about at that time that the machine learning community turned away from being interested in those methods. Um, and the sociologists of science will have to explain this, but um, uh, why a research community would turn away from a set of methods that actually work, but that's what happened. Um, so for a while, uh, uh, a lot of people, including me, stopped working on this, and we only restarted in the early 2000s. Uh, so this is an example from 2003 when I just about, was just about to join NYU, and we worked on a, a project that was funded by DARPA to uh, train uh, a, a robot essentially to drive itself uh, and avoid obstacle. And the system essentially was simply a convolutional net that would get images from uh, cameras on the on this little radio control truck, uh, and then would um, we would collect data of a person driving this little truck who was instructed to just drive straight and avoid obstacles whenever there was one in front. And then we just trained the convolutional net to take the input image and then predict the steering angle produced by the human driver. And then you let the, the truck you know, drive itself um, through this so-called imitation learning process. And uh, as you can see in the, the little video, it, you know, it can sort of navigate its way through uh, uh, complicated obstacles. We showed this to DARPA and they said, that sounds really great. Uh, we should start a bigger project on this. And they started a project called Lager in which we participated where the robots were built uh, for us at Carnegie Mellon. And we used the convolutional net to train this uh, robot to basically drive itself in nature. Um, and what's interesting about this is that the labels that are used to train the system to figure out uh, to drive uh, were actually automatically generated. So what happens here is that uh, you can build, you can, you can uh, write the program that uh, identifies from stereo vision using 3D reconstruction from multiple cameras, uh, you can tell if something in front of you that's nearby is an obstacle or is uh, flat on the ground. And, and so you can um, uh, identify if the robot can drive. But that only works so far because 3D reconstruction only works if you have two cameras that are far from each other and they you know, uh, can reconstruct it to about 10 meters. But of course, to be able to plan a course, you have to look much further. So we use those uh, labels to train a convolutional net. And this is a particular type of convolutional net that is swiped over the entire image. And for each patch of the image, or for each pixel, actually, it, uses a, a large pa it, it looks at a large patch around the pixel. And it decides whether this particular pixel is a piece of ground you can drive over or whether it's something that sticks out of the ground. 
This is the same technique that is used now in medical imaging to detect tumors, for example, in images or, or, or different uh, patterns. You basically swipe the convolutional net over the image, and whenever it fires, there is something interesting that you look at. Um, uh, so this is sort of one, one of the first applications of this uh, idea. Uh, and, and the nice thing is that it doesn't really require hand labeling. The, the data is kind of generated uh, uh, automatically. And so eventually, um, so you can let the, the, the system lose and, and drive itself and uh, take the result of the, the so-called semantic segmentation, which means labeling every pixel with the category of the object it belongs to, put it in a map centered on the robot, and then use this map to plan a course to, towards a, a particular goal. Um, and there are kind of uh, you know, different uh, vision systems working at different time scales. The, the, the long range vision system is the one that uses the uh, convolutional net. Um, so um, uh, once, uh, once the system uh, uh, is trained, you'll see in a, in a moment uh, how it, it behaves uh, when it's let loose. So here's a robot trying to get to a goal and two uh, very annoying students trying to stop it from doing it. Uh, they are entitled to do this because, and they're pretty sure the robot is not gonna break their leg because um, they actually wrote the code and they trained it. So um, uh, on the left is Raya Hetzel. Uh, she leads the robotics research group at DeepMind in London. And on the right, Pierre Semane. He's a research scientist at Google Brain in California. So with this success, we thought we could um, uh, not just label, uh, not just drive robots around, but perhaps do something like um, uh, build self driving cars. So this is a project that took place around 2010. Uh, and uh, we could build a system that, that was able not, not only to, um, you know, label pixels as to whether they were traversable or not, but basically tell you if it's a road, a car, a pedestrian, a uh, building, uh, you know, vegetation or the sky or whatever. And that's the kind of thing you need if you want to build uh, self driving cars. Um, strangely enough, this was uh, again produced around 2010. We submitted a paper to a comput computer vision conference in 2011, and uh, this paper was uh, beating uh, all other methods on three different data sets and was 50 times faster than the best runner up. Uh, so we thought this paper was going to be accepted at the conference, but it was actually rejected, and the reviews were uh, basically what the hell is a convolutional network? Um, <laughs> we don't believe that a method we never heard of could work so well, basically, right? Um, so that's interesting because uh, only three years later, after the deep learning revolution that occurred around 2012, 2013, now you cannot get a paper accepted at CVPR unless you use convolutional nets. Um, so that gave some ideas to a few people who were working on uh, self-driving cars at the time, but using different techniques, and they started switching to using convolutional nets. Um, so this is a different kind of Tesla that you guys are used to. Um, <laughs> Um, right, but the, the Tesla cars uh, use the vision system produced by an Israeli company called Mobileye, at least the two 2015 models, uh, that use the convolutional net for essentially the, the autonomous driving uh, capability. Uh, after that, the two companies divorced, and uh, Mobileye now belongs to Intel, and uh, Tesla has developed its own vision system, also based on convolutional nets. Meanwhile, NVIDIA, the company that builds the GPU cards uh, that are used by everybody in the business, um, also decided to get into the self-driving car, um, uh, autonomous driving. Uh, so that um, has uh, um, really kind of rendered the field very, very interesting, but it has its root in sort of this, this early work. So what happened in 2012, the reason why we hear about uh, deep learning nowadays is because of uh, uh, because in around the end of 2012, a competition called ImageNet was won by our colleagues from University of Toronto, Jeff Hinton and his team, where I, where I did my postdoc in the late 80s before going to Bell Labs. And they smashed the record so much that uh, people basically switched to using commercial nets from one day to the next, uh, from you know, whatever they were using before. What the Toronto team did uh, uh, before everyone and more efficiently than everyone is a very fast implementation of very large commercial nets on GPUs. Uh, which allowed them to train a very, you know, very large networks on this large data set and smash the records. Since then, we've uh, seen an inflation of the number of layers uh, that are used by those networks. The latest ones, uh, things like ResNet and ResNext and DenseNet, which I'm not going to go into the details of, have anywhere between 50 and 150 layers. So those are very, very, very deep neural nets uh, with a few architectural tricks. And 
the result of it is that uh, as the architectures have been refined, the error rate have been going down. So this is the error rate uh, by some measure on this ImageNet data set. So pre-deep learning, the error rates were around 28-25%. Uh, the, the first uh, convolutional net from University of Toronto got it down to 16%, and uh, in the last few years, it's gone down to uh, less than 3%, which is better than human performance on this particular data set. So there's been a tremendous amount of progress. And the reason why this works so well is because, uh, probably because the perceptual world is compositional. So this idea that you ha have to have multiple layers, which was kind of obvious to me for a very long time, but it, was, it turned out to be very difficult to convince the community that this was a good idea to have multiple layers. Uh, it's very natural. It's, you know, the world is compositional and you kind of have to, um, you know, objects are composed of parts and parts are composed of subparts and subparts of motifs and motifs uh, of simple patterns and patterns are, are kind of combinations of edges and you look at the visual cortex, the uh, hierarchy of the eventual pathway in the visual cortex of V1, V2, V4, IT, it, it's very much the same kind of processing that takes place there. So the, the kind of result we can obtain with this are, are pretty astonishing. This is a, a video from our friends at NVIDIA. NVIDIA it turns out has a research lab on autonomous driving in Holmdale, New Jersey, in the very same building where I used to work at Bell Labs. Uh, that uh, building has been uh, kind of refurbished, if you want. And this is a car driving itself. It's basically just a convolutional net. It's been trained on images to imitate the uh, same, same thing as a little truck I showed you, the radio control truck I showed you earlier, uh, except here it's driving a real car. And uh, it can drive the car in you know, rural New Jersey uh, for uh, um, you know quarter of an hour without actually without any uh, human intervention. Uh, more recent progress in uh, computer vision, which I think are more relevant to uh, uh, medical imaging, is something called Max Car CNN. Uh, so this is a, a technique that uh, was produced at, at Facebook AI Research in California, uh, and the code is open source. A very simple, conceptually, uh, a very simple method uh, that allows to produce outputs of this type. So this is really what you need for uh, uh, medical imaging. You you have an image and you have the system essentially not only identify the, all the objects in the image, but also draw an outline of every object in the image. And this system requires only a small amount of uh, uh, samples that have been explicitly outlined. It can be sort of trained with weak supervision. Um, so here it can tell that there are seven people in this uh, uh, picture, and it kind of you know, draws the mask of each person, the baseball bats, the dog, etc the wine glasses, the wine bottle, the computers in the back, the people that we see only part of, uh, the uh, sheeps or whatever, um, et cetera. So that works really extremely well. And the code is available. It's been pre-trained on a bunch of images. And uh, it's a relatively simple matter to fine tune it on whatever data set you have. Uh, it's called Detectron. Uh, Detectron is really kind of a, a name for all kinds of vision techniques that uh, have been coming out of Facebook. Here's another uh, piece of work at Facebook that recently uh, uh, came out called uh, Dense Pose. So uh, this is a very fine-tuned um, estimation of the, the pose of human bodies from, uh, from video. Uh, and uh, essentially what you get out of this is an estimation of a 3D model of each person, even though you only have uh, video from a face camera. Uh, so this is kind of uh, similar to the problem you would have to uh, to solve to, for example, reconstruct a heart from uh, uh, various types of imaging, uh, um, you know, uh, ultrasound or, or various other things. Uh, and, and this works uh, very well. It works actually in real time on a single GPU card, uh, regardless of how many people are in the, in the picture. So it's, uh, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, this is another piece of work that's relevant to medical imaging, although I don't think it's been applied to it yet. And it's the idea of using what's called sparse convolutional nets to uh, uh, process 3D images. So uh, very often real images that are obtained, uh, 3D images that are obtained in the real world, not medical imaging, but not tomography or anything like that, but uh, images that are obtained through uh, LiDAR, for example, or depth uh, camera, are very sparse. So most of the volume is empty, and there is only a, a little bit of voxels that are filled by, by something. Uh, and so what you'd like is you'd like to be able to run a convolutional net without actually spending all your time uh, computing, you know, multiplying zeros, essentially, uh, in the empty space. And this is uh, a technique uh, that was developed at uh, Facebook AI Research in Paris. 
uh, that uh, actually won a competition for 3D object recognition. And I think there might be some relevance to medical imaging here for this kind of technique. So, um, so far I've talked about mostly pixels, but it turns out those convolutional net uh, techniques can be used for all kinds of different applications. And one of the big applications at Facebook is uh, translation, language translation. And it turns out we also use convolutional nets for language translation. And I'm going to go into the details of that, but essentially a sequence of words can be encoded as a sequence of vectors uh, by a very simple single layer neural net. And, uh, and then once it's in the form of a vector, you can view this as a, as a sequence that you can perform convolutions on and, uh, and generate similarly with a similar architecture, a sequence of words in the target language. This is trained supervised and it, it, it works uh, very well. It you know, beats records on a few data sets. So one of the things that, uh, so Facebook AI research was created uh, about four and a half years ago. And it went from essentially zero to about 150 uh, researchers and uh, engineers uh, in about four and a half years. Uh, spread over uh, four main locations and a few satellite labs. So the four main locations are here in New York in, on Astor Place, another one in California at the headquarters of um, uh, Facebook. Uh, the biggest lab, in fact, is in Paris. Uh, it has about 50 people. And then there is a, a more recent smaller lab in Montreal, about, about 20 people or so. And then we have satellite labs in uh, Seattle and uh, Tel Aviv. Um, and we practice open research, so we, we uh, are very open to collaboration with uh, academic groups. Uh, we, um, we share code, we distribute most of our code in open source, we publish all the results that we, uh, that we obtain. Uh, there are other groups within Facebook that uh, take a lot of those methods and kind of apply them to internal problems at Facebook, but that's kind of uh, a different, different group. So one of the things I, I, I want to attract your attention to, I already talked about Detectron. The other one is PyTorch, so PyTorch is a uh, deep learning framework, so it's basically uh, uh, a whole uh, software platform, if you want, that allows you to uh, develop uh, deep learning applications, to uh, experiment with deep learning is particularly appropriate for, for research environments uh, rather than a production environment. So we're gonna have, you know, there's already a lot of applications of convolutional nets and there's new ones popping up every day um, in domains that I would not have imagined, like for example, uh, material design. Um, Turns out that's uh, a very hot topic at the moment, using deep learning for designing materials or for uh, chemistry or for drug design. Um, and more generally, the application of deep learning, of course, medical imaging, you're very familiar with this. Uh, uh, There's information filtering, search, et cetera. Uh, and a lot for science. Uh, uh, convolutional nets are used right now for filtering uh, trajectories of uh, elementary particles uh, at CERN. So the, there's applications everywhere that had no inkling would, would happen. And of course, in uh, medical imaging, there's a lot of applications using architectures similar to the one I mentioned earlier for semantic segmentation. There's particular architectures like this VNet proposal, this derived from earlier work called UNet by different people. Um, uh, the work at the Chinese University um, in uh, Hong Kong um, on, uh, uh, you know, segmenting prostate from, from uh, uh, MR images. So there, there's a lot of uh, really interesting work there and so much uh, hope there that, uh, that, that those things will, will have an impact that there's been a flurry of uh, startups being created around uh, the, the use of deep learning for, for healthcare and particularly for imaging. Um, um, you know, vaguely connected to a few of those like uh, Imagen was actually uh, the CTO is, or the chief scientist is a former student of mine, uh, used to work at Facebook and um, Bay Labs uh, works on um, uh, sound, uh, ultrasound uh, sensors and, and processing. So th there's really a lot of activity there in the commercial world now and uh, it's very promising. I'm not sure all of those would be successful, but, uh, but that's interesting. Um, so there, there is um, a, uh, a trend also right now, which is the, uh, to kind of generalize a little bit the idea of deep learning. Uh, into something called differentiable programming. So really when you create a deep learning system, you assemble modules into a graph of computation. You say, I want a convolution and then this pooling and then uh, this connection skips and then blah, blah, blah. So you, you assemble, you build a graph of operators essentially. And you uh, take advantage of the structure of the, uh, the, you, the deep learning environment you use to automatically compute the, the gradient so, so of the objective function you want to minimize with respect to all the parameters in your system. But it turns out um, 
uh, uh, frameworks like PyTorch allow you to not just build a graph, but actually to just write a program. You just write a program that computes the output of your system or computes an objective function, and automatically behind the scenes, the, the, the mechanics of it, if you want, uh, uh, the machinery behind it computes the gradient of the output of what your program computes with respect to all the parameters in your system, all the coefficients in all the matrices, all the variables that you, that you manipulate. And so it's kind of a, a, a sort of general concept that uh, some people have called this the software 2.0. It's kind of a different way of programming a machine. You don't specify the entire program. You just specify kind of the sequence, the pot potential sequence of operations, but the, the, the operations are not completely specified. There's some free parameters in them. And you rely on learning to kind of finalize what the program actually does. So this may actually, there might be a lot of people in the future who actually produce this kind of software as opposed to the kind of software we're used to today. Um, and this is particularly useful at the moment for things like natural language understanding, but it's, uh, I think it's going to become useful for a lot of applications, including uh, medical imaging. Let me skip ahead a little bit. Um, so here is a good example. Uh, this is something that also is relevant, perhaps, for medical uh, image analysis, and it's very early work, but it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. Let's say you have an image, and you're not interested in a complete description of the image. You want to ask a question to the machine, and you want the machine to answer that question. So for example, here is the picture here at the bottom, uh, and the question is, is there a matte cube that has the same size as the red metal object? Okay, so to be able to answer that question, you kind of have to configure your, your, your brain if you want to kind of count the mat cubes or detect them and then et cetera. So here's a more specific example here uh, with uh, an architecture that actually tries to solve this. So here's a question, are there more uh, cubes than yellow things? And if you want to be able to answer that question, you have to basically generate a visual program that will first detect all the, the cubes and all the yellow things, then count them, then compare the two numbers and tell you which one is larger, right? That's kind of what we do when we, we kind of program ourselves to do this, right? That's exactly what this uh, deep learning system does. Uh, the uh, question is encoded by what's called an LSTM, which is a recurrent neural net, into a vector that represents the meaning of the, of the question, if you want. Uh, then that goes into another LSTM that produces a visual program. And a visual program is nothing more than uh, a kind of a graph of modules, each of which is supposed to compute a piece of the answer, like detect the yellow objects, detect the cube, count the cubes, uh, count the yellow objects, and compare the two numbers. And so that uh, green uh, graph here is generated on the fly uh, in a data-dependent way, uh, but it's really a neural net. It's a dynamic neural net. And then the, when the image is, is fed through, you, you train the system to produce the correct answer on a bunch of training samples. And the amazing thing is that the, the system actually learns to produce appropriate programs to answer particular questions. And so I imagine this is uh, the you know, some, some version of this could be useful for answering a particular question. If you had kind of an automated assistant for uh, radiology where you could ask the, you know, a particular question here, you know, uh, you don't have access perhaps to th those systems. Uh, this might become very important because you might imagine having an uh, image analysis system for radiology that directly work from raw data from your MR machines, uh, MRI machines. Uh, in, a, in a form that you can't really visualize. Uh, it has access to more data than, than we can have through our displays. And so you will have to be able to ask it questions like that, that you can answer by just looking at it. So for example, there's uh, some work now uh, on uh, you know, working on uh, detection techniques directly in case space, for example, from uh, um, uh, imaging. Uh, there's some also exciting work, which is uh, perhaps you know, a, a few years uh, away from practical applications in medical imaging, but I think very promising, which is the idea of applying convolutional nets or similar methods to data that does not come to you in the form of a multidimensional array. So it's not a 2D image or 3D image. It's basically a function on a graph. So imagine, for example, that uh, you do brain imaging. Uh, the shape of the brain, of course, is not the same for everybody. So you'd like the, the convolutional net to be kind of to conform to the, the shape of the brain you're looking at. And, and really sort of analyze the, you know, the, the cortex area, for example, uh, uh, and adapt to the, to the local shape. And so there, the, the data that you have is not a fixed uh, 3D volume or 2D image. It's really kind of a, a function on a, on a graph. You can sort of map a, a mesh on the, on, the, on the brain and sort of remap this mesh for different brains so that you know, similar areas are in similar place in the, in the graph. And so there are techniques to do this. They have not been applied to medical imaging as far as I know yet, but it's very promising. 
and uh, I, I expect to see very interesting stuff from there. I, uh, Michael Bronstein, a bunch of co-authors, and, and myself wrote a review papers on those techniques. Uh, if you are inclined to um, look at this, um, um, I think there is a lot of things to do in this area. Okay, there is an uh, other type of, lear of uh, learning that, that people are really um, excited about called uh, reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is a technique by which you don't tell the machine the correct answer. You tell it whether the answer it produced was right or wrong. So that's been uh, smashingly successful for getting machines to play games. You can train machines to play Doom, for example, to superhuman level. Uh, and this is the video from a, a Doom competition that a team from Facebook actually won tw uh, two years in a row. Uh, it, of course, that's a technique that is used, uh, was used by your colleagues at DeepMind to uh, train a system to play Go. Uh, called uh, AlphaGo, and it's uh, AlphaGo Zero also, where the system is trained basically from scratch uh, without knowing pretty much anything uh, about, about the game beforehand. So this is very successful, except it requires many, many, many trials for a reinforcement learning system to learn a, a task. Uh, in fact, uh, if you want to get a machine to play a simple Atari game, for example, it takes on average, for the best uh, reinforcement learning methods that, that we have at the moment, about 80, 80 hours of training uh, for, for one game. Whereas, uh, to reach uh, kind of human performance, if you want. Whereas, uh, a person can reach that performance within minutes of playing. So, there's obviously something we're missing about uh, how humans and animals learn. Um, if we were to use reinforcement learning today to train a car to drive itself, it would have to run off a cliff maybe 50,000 times before it figures out it's a bad idea to run off a cliff. <laughs> and then another 50,000 times to figure out how not to uh, drive off a cliff. Uh, so that's the problem. It, it works for games because, you know, in games you can make mistakes. It doesn't kill you. In the real world, any mistake you make can kill you, right? Uh, and in medicine, any mistake you, you make can kill other people. I mean, it's, you know. Um, so... Uh, so there, there's a problem with the real world, which is, uh, you know, it's a dangerous place, and also you can't run it faster than real time. So you can't have a system have, uh, uh, you know, millions and millions of, uh, of trials to, to learn something, except in certain cases. If uh, what you're training the system to do is figure out uh, what to show you in, the, in search results, things like this actually work, because there are millions of users, billions of users on the, on the Internet. So what are we missing? Uh, uh, to get to real AI, uh, sort of the type of AI that we observe not, not just in humans, but also in intelligent um, animals. And, you know, here, is, here are the things that we can get with current technology in green on the left, and the things that we can't get yet because we don't have the kind of uh, uh, learning techniques that uh, people uh, are able to do. So we can have safer cars, autonomous driving, better medical image analysis, personalized medicine, as, as uh, we just heard. Uh, translation that's adequate, not great, uh, useful but stupid chatbots, um, you know, search retrieval, filtering of information, etc. A lot of applications that are going to uh, penetrate all corners of the economy over the next uh, decade or two. But we can't have machines that have common sense. We can't have intelligent personal assistant, at least not personal assistant that we can talk to in a non-frustrating way. We can't have household robots. It's, it's impractical today to actually build a robot that can fill up your dishwasher. I mean, it's a very simple task, but you know, we don't know how to do that. And we certainly can't have artificially, uh, artificial general intelligence, so you know, machines that have some autonomy and uh, can, you know, adapt to new tasks. So how, you know, what, what are we missing? Like, you know, let's look at babies. Um, so babies learn a huge amount about the world, basically just by observation, with very little interaction with the world in the first few weeks and months of life. Uh, so, you know, basic things like the fact that the world is three-dimensional, the fact that there is object permanence. So if I take an object and I hide it behind another one, you know it's still there. Uh, you know, babies below two months, two months old probably don't know this yet. Um, and then notions that are pretty obvious that uh, if an object is not supported, it's going to fall. You know, kind of basic notion of gravity and intuitive physics. Uh, babies learn this between the age of six and eight months. So if you show a little scenario at the top here of a little car, that you know, drives off a cliff and doesn't fall, uh, a young baby before six months would say, sure. I mean, it won't say anything, but <laughs> would you know, react as if this is normal. That's the way the world works. No problem. After eight months, they go like the little girl here at the bottom left. Um, 
they're very surprised. And their eyes go like this, and they pay attention, and, they, and you can measure this, right? So this is the technique that psychologists uh, use. So I, I uh, stole those, the slide from Emmanuel Dupou, who is a, a developmental cognitive psychologist in Paris, who studies the early development in, in children, particularly language acquisition. And so you, you can measure how surprised babies are. And when they're surprised, that means their world model has been violated. Um, and that way, you know, he's been able to establish this. Uh, it's not just his work, but uh, work of various people. At what age babies learn various concepts, like things like the fact that there are inanimate objects and animate objects. You learn this pretty early, around two or three months. Uh, object permanent is probably before two months. It's hard to measure before that. Uh, stability and support. Uh, gravity, inertia, conservation of momentum, this kind of stuff. Uh, that, uh, that comes around you know, between six and eight months. And so you know, at that age, uh, kids basically are completely helpless in, in, in terms of motor control. Most of what they learn is by observation. But what they learn is an enormous amount of background information about how the world works. And that's what we don't know how to do with machines. So we'd like to be able to get machines to learn a lot about the real world just by observation. <laughs> Uh, so that when they need to learn a task, then they can use this background knowledge and learn the task very quickly, which is basically the, what we think, how we think you know, human, or how I think uh, human and animal learning works. And to some extent, the essence of intelligence is the ability to predict. So perhaps uh, a hypothesis is that this kind of learning is based on prediction. So for example, uh, here is uh, a baby orangutan here that is being shown a magic trick. It's an object that's put in this uh, cup and then the object is removed, but the baby orangutan doesn't realize it. And then he looks at the cup, it's empty, and he's rolling on the floor laughing. <laughs> um, so his model of the world has been broken. Orangutans are almost as smart as humans. Um, we're only sort of marginally smarter than them. We think we're way smarter, but we're not. And they don't, they're not social animals, they're not, they don't have language. They, um, you know, but it's relatively similar. They have very good world models. They can build tools, you know, they can predict the consequences of their actions. So the idea of prediction, not just temporal prediction, but just filling in the blanks. So things like, you know, if uh, you see the one side of my face, you can pretty much infer what the other side looks like because most people are more or less symmetric. Um, and, you know, you know that, you know, if I put a pen on the, on the table and let it go, it's gonna fall. You can't tell in which direction, but you can tell it's gonna fall. And the, what's interesting is that there is a lot more information that a machine can gather by essentially training itself to predict everything that's going to happen, predict every observation from every other observation, uh, than there is by training it in a supervised mode to uh, perform a particular task or by training it a fortiori using reinforcement. So um, essentially with reinforcement learning, you're telling the machine only you did good, you did bad. Uh, supervised learning, you, t you tell it here is what you should have produced. In uh, self-supervised predictive learning, you tell it, you know, just predict everything. Like, I'm not telling you what's important. Just try to predict everything from everything else. And then once I show you a task, you will have good representations of the world that will allow you to learn this with a very small number of samples. So um, that led me to this uh, sl slightly obnoxious uh, machine learning meme. Uh, it's become a meme in the machine learning community that uh, if intelligence uh, is a cake, the bulk of the cake de Genoise is, um, this self-supervised predictive learning, the icing on the cake is supervised learning, and the cherry on the cake is reinforcement learning because that kind of measures the relative importance of the amount of information, of feedback you give to the machine. So there's really kind of two big questions on the way to real AI. One is how can machines learn as efficiently as humans and animals by observation, without supervision, with very little interaction with the world? Um, how can we train machines to plan and act, uh, not just perceive? And uh, my opinion is that uh, learning predictive forward models of the world under uncertainty is really kind of the key to uh, those two problems. So whatever the next revolution AI will be, and I hope it's not gonna wait too long to arrive, it will not be supervised, nor purely reinforced. Um, the, the kind of cultural reference here is due to Eliosha Efros, who's a colleague at Berkeley. Um, so, the, uh, the, the common, sense, uh, common sense perhaps is this ability to fill in the blanks, essentially. We know enough about the structure of the world that we can sort of infer uh, a lot of things about the world with very partial information. Um, so if I say, if you close your eyes and I say, uh, uh, Bashir picks up his bag and leaves the room, 
uh, you don't have to know anything about the situation. You can sort of picture the sequence of events that have to occur because you know the constraint of the world is not going to fly away and uh, is not going to dematerialize. He's um, probably going to stand up and you know extend his arm and walk towards the door. It's not going to go right through the wall. I mean, you know the constraints of the real world. That's what allows you to fill in the blanks uh, from just those few words. So how do we learn predictive models of the world? Um, and it's uh, a very classical approach to optimal control uh, for controlling robots, for example, is you have a precise dynamical model of the robot you want to control, or the plant, as they call it in, uh, uh, in um, uh, control theory. And you use this as a way to predict what's going to happen. You kind of run. Um, so for example, uh, you're NASA in the 60s, and you want to shoot a rocket, uh, put it in orbit, and rendezvous with uh, uh, you know, the lamb that has already been sent, or something like this. You, um, you have to plan a trajectory. And the alg algorithm that is, was used, um, I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Hidden Figures. If you haven't, you should. Uh, so it's a story of uh, black women working for NASA, actually computing trajectories for rockets in the 60s. And then a computer shows up, and they decide to learn how to program the computer. The algorithm they program this computer is this one, uh, which is uh, the idea that you have a, a, a model that gives you the state of the rocket at time t plus delta t, given the state at time t, and uh, a set of commands. And by rolling out the system and figuring out a sequence of commands that minimize uh, a particular objective function, you compute a trajectory that's optimal in terms of speed, uh, fuel consumption, whatever. Um, so that's very classical in uh, optimal control. And we need AI systems to have this capability of predicting what's going to happen. But we'd like those models to be flexible and trained as opposed to handcrafted. And so if we uh, look at the design of an AI system uh, of the future, no, none of them today is really designed like this, except with, you know, with like, exceptions that can be counted on the fingers of one hand. Um, uh, you'd like the agent, uh, before it produces actions to act on the world, you'd like it to think in its head about the consequences of its actions, and then design a, an action sequence that will optimize a particular uh, uh, criterion, <coughs> if you want. And the, the, the piece, I'm not going to go into the details of what those pieces are doing, but the piece we're missing is this, this world simulator, basically. How do we get a machine to learn uh, a model of the world, a predictive model of the world, that will allow it to kind of uh, predict the consequences of its actions and plan uh, ahead? So there were some attempts at, at, at doing this uh, going back a few years. This is some work by some of my colleagues at Facebook on uh, uh, you know, a very simple situation where you stack a bunch of cubes and then you ask the machine, can you predict where the cubes are going to fall? And of course, you run, either you run a simulation or you have real data, and you observe where the cubes fall. You train a convolutional net to predict where the cubes are going to fall. And what happens is that you get uh, this, this kind of fuzzy prediction here, right? So this, guy, so this is what actually occurs, uh, produced by the simulator. Here, this is the real world. And this is what's predicted by the convolutional net. And you get those fuzzy predictions. And the reason it's fuzzy is that the system cannot actually exactly predict where the cube is going to fall. And so there's a little bit of uncertainty. So it makes this pretty fuzzy prediction, which is not a good prediction. So one question is, how do you make a machine to predict under a certainty? That's a big question. In fact, that's probably the biggest uh, conceptual question that I think we need to solve on the way to, uh, to AI. Um, how do we get a machine to predict? when there is no single correct answer for the prediction, but there are multiple plausible answers. And uh, you know, without boring you with uh, 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 technical questions or details, um, the, the best idea for doing this at the moment is something called adversarial training. Uh, there are several ideas, but that's uh, one of the most successful ones uh, so far, or generative adversarial networks, uh, known as GANs. Uh, the idea came out of... Uh, uh, University of Montreal, Joshua Benjo's lab at University of Montreal. He's uh, one of the leaders in uh, deep learning uh, by one of his former students now, uh, Ian Goodfellow. And the idea of uh, adversarial training is that you train two neural nets. You train a predictor to predict what's going to happen in the future. So here, for example, uh, the, uh, the predictor is actually called a generator in this context. So the machine observes a few frames from a video, and it's asked to predict what's going to happen next in the video. And so, of course, the, you have the video snippet, so you know what's going to happen. The data set contains the future of that video. Um, and you feed this to uh, another, a second neural net that is not predicting. The second neural net is just there to learn to assess whether the prediction is good or bad. Okay? So the discriminator here is going to be uh, trained to produce, say, zero if uh, 
what it sees on this input is actually what, what happened. And it's going to be trained to produce one or a large number if what, uh, uh, what it sees is produced is not the real thing, but it's produced by, say, a predictor like the generator. So the discriminator learns to uh, tell whether a prediction looks good or looks bad and look, you know, learns to discriminate between plausible futures and implausible futures. So essentially, the generator trains itself so that it produces predictions that the dis discriminator cannot tell are fake. And it cheats because it can use the information of the discriminator to figure out in which way to change its output so that the discriminator won't be able to tell it's fake. Uh, <laughs> using backpropagation, it's very simple. And so in the end, both the generator and the dis discriminator train each other, and uh, the generator can uh, produce uh, nice looking pictures. So this is an example of a, this is the pictures from a paper that really convinced people that this technique uh, really had something to it. Uh, one of the co-authors, Sumit Chintala, is at Facebook. And the, this system was trained on pictures of um, bedrooms and then was asked to just generate random bedrooms. And those are non-existing bedrooms, basically. So the neural net takes a bunch of random numbers and out comes the picture of a bedroom. And those are the bedrooms. It's pretty amazing. Uh, low resolution images. Here's something a little more impressive. This is work from NVIDIA from just a few months ago. In fact, the paper for this is going to be presented at the ICLR conference next week in Vancouver which I'm the chair of. And these are high resolution images of, that look like pictures of celebrities. But those are non-existing celebrities. Uh, so this network has been trained on photos of celebrities. Uh, and then you feed it a bunch of random numbers and I come a picture of a non-existing celebrity. So it can interpolate between celebrities if you want. And so those are probably kind of mixtures of existing celebrities if you, if you th think of this in those terms. There's an interesting piece of work at Facebook AI Research in Paris where people have trained one of those uh, adversarial networks so that uh, it, it provides you with sort of tunable uh, input variables that allows you to control and transform an image. So in the second row here, you see a picture of a lady, um, a kind of middle-aged lady if you want, and that's the original picture of the lady and you can make the lady look younger or older. Uh, you can get this androgynous uh, person look more like a, like a woman or more like a man, and vice versa here. So um, it gives you sort of adjustable parameters. That's, that's pretty, um, pretty interesting. But we've been trying to, do, to use adversarial training for this problem of video prediction uh, because we'd like systems to learn how the world works. And so um, these are a few examples of predictions uh, from video snippets where the first four frames are observed and the last two frames indicated by the red uh, contour uh, are predicted. Uh, at the top right, you see those fuzzy predictions. This is a result of using traditional supervised learning to train a conventional net to predict the future. And it gets, you know, it predicts those fuzzy predictions because it's not able to pick among all the possible futures which one is going to happen. So it predicts, it predicts the average. Uh, whereas adversarial training allows, you know, lets the system predict one particular instance if it wants. Uh, similarly, for you can. Um, have machines predict what uh, New York apartments are, suppo are supposed to look like when you turn the camera. So they only see a piece of the apartment and then you turn the camera. And then at the bottom here, you see this, uh, you see this bookcase here. This part of the bookcase is completely invented. Uh, here when it turns red, that's part, that part of the bookcase is invented. So it, it has captured some structure of, the, of, uh, of what goes on. Here's another uh, experiment uh, done at Facebook AI Research in Paris uh, also, where I've been involved in the research somehow. Uh, so this is the result of applying semantic segmentation to images of streets or videos in streets. And then you run this prediction algorithm in the space of those segmentations. So you don't try to reconstruct the entire image. You just try to figure out, you know, where are the cars going to go in the future? Where are pedestrians are going to go in the future? So pedestrians that start crossing the street keep crossing the streets. Cars that start turning left keep turning left. So it gives you a good model of, you know, predict, predicting what's going to happen. And that's very good if you, if you drive. Um, you would like to have a good predictive model of what's going <laughs> what's to happen. Um, let me skip ahead a little bit and talk about the future impact of, uh, of AI and where the field is going. So there's promising areas of research. Uh, as I said, marrying deep learning and logical reasoning, uh, re replacing symbols by vectors, logic by algebra, self-supervised learning, learning hierarchical representations of control space, instantiating complex abstract action plans, uh, et cetera. There's more theory work that's been done. The, the, Deep learning is not completely understood theoretically, and there's a lot of work uh, going on in there. And there is uh, uh, work in, that's kind of more computer science-y in designing compilers for those differentiable programming uh, environments. 
Um, ultimately, um, th there's an interesting phenomenon that's happening, which is that uh, we are building artifacts before we do the complete science. We don't have a science of intelligence. Uh, there is a, a theory for, for learning, but no real science for intelligence. But in fact, historically, science, uh, scientific uh, fields have been developed because of an artifact that was particularly interesting. So people started building telescopes and microscopes before optics was figured out, you know, before uh, I ran out of brain cells, which may happen faster than I desire. Um, okay, so clearly AI is going to uh, change the, the way we, we think about things and, and the way we look at society. Um, it's already the case, for example, that material goods are extremely cheap compared to everything else. So you can buy a Blu-ray player, an incredibly sophisticated piece of technology for 47 bucks on your favorite online uh, store. And it's incredibly sophisticated. It's got technology in it that didn't exist 10 years ago. Uh, blue lasers, H.264, compression, all kinds of stuff. On the other hand, you want to buy a handmade ceramic bowl. Uh, technology is about 8,000 years old, if not more. It's going to cost you 750 bucks, I mean, at least from this vendor. <laughs> um, what's the difference? The difference is uh, human experience, right? The, the ceramic bowl was made by a person. The Blu-ray player was made by a machine, essentially, or by a bunch of machines. It's very little human intervention. You can download uh, an opera or a song or an entire album for a few bucks. If you go to a performance at the Met, uh, the most expensive one are about 800 dollars, the cheaper, cheaper one are like $200. So we give value to human, authentic human experience and things that are automated basically go down in value. So that's what it, what's going to happen. Things that are going to be automated by AI are going to get cheaper. And what that means is that we're going to do more of it. Okay, it doesn't mean that the people doing it, like say, if radiology, if a big chunk of radiology is automated by AI system, it doesn't mean we're going to need fewer radiologists. It means that we're going to do more, you know, more, more, more imaging, uh, delays are going to be shorter for uh, diagnosis. Um, and the radiologists are going to be able to concentrate on the interesting cases because the simpler ones are going to be just filtered out by uh, AI. So it's going to transform the profession, there's no question, but it's not going to make it go away. Um, I hope I'm reassuring a few people here. I don't know if you're worried about it, but, um, but it's, it's, not, it's not going to go away. Um, it's going to transform the profession. There is no question about it. Um, so there's an interesting thing that uh, economists uh, are saying, which is uh, AI is a general purpose technology. So I never thought of this this way, but I, I went to a workshop um, uh, of very famous economists who were talking about AI, and they talk about it in terms of a general purpose technology, which is a technology that's going to penetrate all corners of the economy. And what they say is that, um, of course, as technology progresses, the skills of people, of the workforce, kind of trails behind a little bit, right? There's a bunch of people who haven't been trained to deal with the, you know, the, the, new, the new technology and will have a hard time getting jobs because the professions are, are, are changing, right? And they're not adapting fast enough. But what the economists are saying, so I was worried that perhaps with the acceleration of progressive technology, there could be more and more people training behind. But economists are saying, actually, it's the proportion of people training behind that limits the speed at which the technology actually penetrates the economy. So the reason it took 20 years for computer technology, for example, to actually have a measurable impact on productivity is because people, it just took 20 years for people to train to use a mouse and a keyboard, essentially. That's what it comes down to. Um, so the same thing is going to happen for AI, which means if a country or a region wants to take advantage of the transformation of AI, uh, it has to invest massively in education and particularly adult education. So um, I'm going to stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for this uh, amazing overview and for the positive note at the end. We still have time. So uh, we have time for uh, maybe a few questions. Uh, please take the microphone on the side if you have any questions. So the first question is that, according to your opinion, so why, um, why did uh, deep, deep learning become so successful in the last few years, but not more earlier? Somebody says it's because of uh, the increasing of computational power plus a few new ideas. So do you agree with that? 
Well, there's two uh, questions, right? Yes. The, the, yeah. the, 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 the first question is, uh, why did you become successful in the last few years? And perhaps the answer is, you know, there's a few tricks that we came up with over, over the last few years, but that's not that important. Uh, the second thing is the availability of large data sets. And the third thing, of course, the availability of cheap, uh, high power uh, computing engines in the form of GPUs. But the second question is, why didn't that happen earlier? My expectation when I was working on this in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, was that the progress was going to be more continuous. But what happened is that in the mid-90s, people just completely abandoned the idea of using neural nets. And there was this legend within the community that neural nets didn't work. Um, and it's because people weren't doing the experiments properly. There was uh, basically a, a, lot of, a bit of black art in making those things work. And people, particularly in the academic research community, like to have uh, mathematics and proof that, that, that show that things work. And so that caused, to some extent, a, a methodological flaw at, at the level of the community where people worked on methods that they couldn't understand but didn't necessarily work better, ignored the empirical result that showed other methods were actually working better, um, and, and didn't work on, on neural nets, which experimentally were working better but were less understood uh, theoretically. So to me, it's a little similar to uh, the, whole, the, the old idea of the, uh, the drunkard who, you know, is looking on the, on the ground in the street um, and someone comes and says, did you lose something? Yeah, I lost my key. Um, where did you use your key? Oh, out there. Why are you looking here? Because the light is here. <laughs> um, so it's a bit of the same thing. You know, you, you only work on things you can understand uh, and ignore the things that actually work. Um, and instead of trying to understand them, you kind of do as if they don't exist. That's a bit of kind of a psychosis, I think, that the community went through. Uh, I can't explain why. It's uh, very mysterious. The question is Yes, so Jan, a fascinating talk. Um, so my question is that uh, in um, radiology, there are something like 2,600 findings. And uh, many of these are associated with rare diseases for which there is no data or there is little data. So how do you see the, the science and then the theory, the technology evolving towards training with less data? So I, I, might, I might surprise you, but it turns out uh, Facebook is facing a very similar problem. Uh, people on Facebook uh, use, you know, speak several thousand languages uh, on the order of 5,000. There's about 7,000 languages that are spoken in the world. Uh, and a good proportion of those are used on Facebook. So Facebook is supposed to do content moderation, right? Uh, in fact, uh, just recently, a few days ago, published the, the whole rules of what is authorized and not authorized on Facebook uh, to protect integrity and all kinds of stuff. Um, how do you do this with 5,000 languages, most of which have essentially no data to train on, right? Uh, for which the number of speakers is very small. Uh, if you want to do translation, you may have enough data to translate uh, French into English and, and vice versa. But if you want to uh, translate uh, Swahili to Turkish or, uh, I don't know, uh, Burmese to uh, uh, Breton or something, right, there's no data, like zero. Okay. So how do you uh, train uh, a system like this? Same for, there's a service within Facebook. Uh, to recognize essentially anything in an image. Uh, so any product group can take uh, uh, a pre-trained convolutional net that has been trained to recognize a very large number of different categories and things. And it can, with just a few examples, train the top two or three layers of a neural net to recognize a particular thing. That, that's useful, for example, uh, a couple of years ago there was a terrorist attack in Paris and a lot of people replaced their uh, profile picture by overlaying a, a French flag. Uh, you like to be able to train a classifier to do this, and it's not worth spending, you know, a lot of time collecting a data set. It's just one person kind of clicking on a few images, and then you'd like to train a classifier and then count how many people did this. That would be kind of an interesting uh, sociological experiment. And um, you can do this with those techniques. So that's, that's transfer learning. So what we'd like is find kind of similar things that would allow us to, for example, train uh, a, a medical image analysis system that does not do anything, it just learns about the structure of medical imaging or medical images of a particular type, completely unsupervised. It learns to reconstruct them, for example, to represent them in a hierarchical manner, so that now when you have a particular task uh, that you want to train on, and that's kind of the topic of the, the entire topic of my uh, 
uh, spiel on, on unsupervised running, when you have an actual task, you, you only require a few samples to actually uh, uh, get the machine to run the task because it's already learned to represent uh, images generically without uh, focusing on any particular task. I think that's the way of the future. I think actually next week you're gonna, if you pay attention, you're gonna hear announcements by Facebook along this line where uh, new vision system have been trained essentially unsupervised uh, and get really, really good results. So um, that's the way of the future, unsupervised running. As I said, the revolution will not be supervised. Okay, uh, yeah, and we would like to give you this very heavy gift for oh. your amazing uh, presentation. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.